Okay, let's make a start. So I hope everyone had a good, uh, a good break. We're going to spend uh, this week looking at repeated interaction. And we already saw last time before the break that uh, we, once we re repeat games, once games go on for a while, we can sustain behavior that's quite interesting. So for example, before the break, we saw that we could sustain fighting by players that were rational in a, in a war of attrition. All right? And another thing we learned before the break was when we're analyzing these potentially very long games, it helps sometimes to break, it, break the analysis up into what we might call stage games, each, each period of the game, and break the payoffs up into the payoffs that are associated with that stage, payoffs that are associated with the past, but they're sunk, they don't really matter, and payoffs that are going to come in the future from future equilibrium play. So those are some ideas we're going to pick up today, but for, that, for the most part, what we do today will be new. Now, whereas last time we focused on fighting, for the whole of today, I want to focus on the issue of cooperation. For the whole of this week, I want to, issue, I want to focus on the issue of cooperation. And the question kind of behind everything this week is going to be, can repeated interaction among players both induce and sustain cooperative behavior, or if you like, good behavior? And our canonical example is going to be Prisoner's Dilemma. Way back in the very first class, <laughs> we talked about Prisoner's Dilemma, and we mentioned that playing the game repeatedly might be able to get us out of the dilemma. It might be able to enable us to sustain cooperation. Right? And what's going to be good about that is not just sustain cooperation, but sustain cooperation without the use of outside payments, such as contracts or the mafia or whatever. All right, so why does this matter? Well, one reason it matters is that most interactions in society either don't or perhaps even can't relate, uh, uh, rely on contracts. Right? The most, most relationships are not contractual. However, many relationships are repeated. All right, so this is going to be of, of more importance, perhaps, in general life, though perhaps less, less so in business, more important in general life than uh, thinking about contracts. So just think about some obvious examples. Think about your own friendships. I don't know if you have any friendships. I assume you do. But for those of you who do, your friendships are typically not contractual. You don't have a contract that says, if you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. All right? Similarly, think about interactions among nations. Interactions among nations typically cannot be contractual because there's no court to enforce those, uh, those, those would-be contracts, although you can have treaties, I suppose. But most interaction among na nations, uh, cooperation among nations, is sustained by the fact that those, that those relationships are going to go on forever. All right? And even in business, even where we have contracts, and even in a very litigious society like the US, which is probably the most litigious society in the world, we can't really rely on contracts for everyday business, business relationships. All right? So in some sense, we need a way to model a way to sustain cooperation and good, and good behavior that forms, if you like, the social fabric of our society, absence always going to court about everything. All right? Now, why might repeated interaction work? Why do, we think, why do we think way back in day one of the class that repeated interaction might be able to enable us to behave well, even in situations like prisoner's dilemmas or situations involving moral hazard where bad behavior is going to occur in one-shot games? All right, so the lesson we're going to be sort of underlying things today and all week is this one. In ongoing, in ongoing relationships, In ongoing relationships, the promise of future rewards and the threat of future punishments. future punishment may, let's be careful, may sometimes, may sometimes provide incentives 
for good behaviour today. And just leave a gap here but in your notes because we're going to come back to this. So this is a very general idea. The idea is that future behavior in the relationship can, can generate the possibility of future rewards or, and or future punishments, and those promises or threats may sometimes provide incentives for people to behave well today. And I'm being like, the reason I want to leave a gap here is I want part of the purpose of this week's lectures to be trying to get beyond this. This is kind of a, almost a platitude, right? I think you, most of you knew this already. All right? So I want to get beyond this. I want to see when, can it, when is this going to work? When is it not going to work? How is it going to work? All right? So I don't, need, I don't want people to leave the week, leave this week of classes or leave the course thinking, oh, well, this relationship's going to, going to, going to, uh, we're going to interact more than once, so everything's fine. That's not true. All right? we, want to, we want to make sure that we understand when things work, how they work, and more importantly, when they don't work and how they don't work. All right? So we're going to try and fill in the gap that we've just left on that board as we go on today. All right. Nevertheless, we do have this very strong intuition that repeated interaction will get us, as it were, out of the prisoner's dilemma. So why don't we start with the prisoner's dilemma? I'll put this up out the way. We'll come back to it. And let's just remind ourselves what the prisoner's dilemma is, because you guys are all full of turkey and cranberry sauce, and you've probably forgotten what game theory is entirely. And let's, let's, let's name these strategies, rather than alpha and beta, let's call them cooperation and defect. And that'll be our convention this week. We'll call them cooperation and defect. This is player A, and this is player B. And the payoffs are something like this. 2, 2, minus 1, 3, 3, minus 1, and 0, 0. Doesn't have to be exactly this, but this will do. Right, so this is the game we're going to play, and to try and see if we get cooperation out of it uh, by, by, having it, by having repeated interaction, we're going to play it more than once. All right, so let me uh, go and find some, some players to play here. This should be a familiar game to everybody here. All right, so why don't I pick some people kind of close to the front row. So, so what, what's, what's, what's your name again? Casper. I'm going to use the green one over here. So say again. Brooks. Okay, so Brooks is, is going to be player. Brooks is going to be player. I guess B. We'll make you player B. And I, I've forgotten your name. I by this stage, I should know it. Patrick, you're going to be player A. All right. And the difference between playing this game now and playing this game earlier on in the class is we're going to play not once, but twice. We're going to play it twice. So write down what you're going to do the first time. Write down what you're going to do the first time and show it to your neighbour. Don't show it to each other. All right. And let's find out what they did the first time. So uh, it's written down, something written down. So uh, Brooks, when? I cooperated. You cooperated. Patrick? I defected. Oh, Patrick defected. OK, OK, well, let's, OK, let's, let's play the second time. All right, second time. So write down what we're going to do the second time. Brooks? Uh, this time I'm going to defect. Me too. All right, so we had, we had the play this time. Let's just put it up here. So the play, that, uh, when we played it this time, we had A and B, and the first time we had defect cooperate, and the second time we had defect defect. All right, let's try another pair. We'll just play this a couple of times and we'll talk about it. So, uh, yeah, that's fair enough. Why don't we go to your neighbors? That seems fair enough. It's easy. So, you are? Ben. So, shout it out to people, are you? Ben. That's a good name. It's good. Very good. Okay. <laughs> and you, you are? Edwina. Edwina. Edwina and Ben. Okay. So, <laughs> we're going to make Ben play a B and Edwina play a A. And why don't you write down what you're going to do? For, for the first time. Again, we're going to play it twice. All right. All right. Why, don't we, why don't we mix it up? We can play it three times. It's not, we'll play it three times this time, okay? We'll play it three times. All right. Both, both people are happy with their decisions. Okay. So the first time, uh, Edwina, what did you choose? Defect. Cooperate. All right. So we had, let's put it down this time. So we've got <laughs> Edwina, Edwina will play A and Ben B. And we had cooperate, defect. All right. Second time, please. Uh, Edwin? Uh, cooperate. Defect. Oh, OK. So we're getting rid of uh, going to and fro now. Uh, so this was cooperate and defect. And one more time. One more time. Write, write down. Both players written down. Edwin? Cooperate. 
Correct effect. Oh, okay, so we flipped around again, okay. Okay, so we're seeing some pretty odd behavior here. Uh, what, who, who did what that time? Uh, Edwina, what did you do? Uh, so we had, we had this, is that right? We had this, all right. So keep the microphones for a minute, and uh, we'll, just, we'll just talk about it in a second. All right, so first of all, let's, let's, let's start with, uh, uh, with Ben here. Ben, you were cooperating in the first go. All right, so why, were you, why did you choose to cooperate the first term? Shout I out so people can hear you. I felt that if I established a reputation <laughs> for cooperating, we could end up in the cooperate, cooperate. All right, so you thought that by, by playing cooperate early, you could establish some kind of reputation. Uh, and what about later on when you played, you played the fact thereafter? What, what were you thinking there? I realized that she established a reputation for defecting, so I couldn't <laughs> All right, <laughs> all right, so you switched strategies mid-course. All right, uh, um, uh, Edwina, you started off by defecting. Why did you start off by defecting? Shout out so people can hear you. Because his friend defected, so I thought he might defect. Oh, because his friend defected, okay, okay, so that's a bit tainted by his friend there, okay. Uh, all right, it's the shortest space for the class, and they could have just been sitting next to each other. And th thereafter, you cooperated, why was that? Because I thought he cooperated, maybe he was gonna keep all right, so, you, so in fact your reputation works in some sense. By cooperating early, you convinced that you would cooperate, and then you went on cooperating even after he defected. So what, what were you doing in the third round? <laughs> Shout out. Um, I, thought, I thought he might cooperate because I cooperated. All right, you thought he might come back. Let's talk about your neighbors. So uh, Brooks, Brooks, why, shout out why, uh, why you cooperated in the first round. Um, because I was hopeful that he would cooperate. You were hoping he would cooperate, yeah. all right, all right. And why did you defect thereafter? Um, because I thought he would continue to defect after he defected. Because he defects and you thought he'd continue to defect. And Patrick, why, you, you, you're the person who just defected throughout here. Uh, grab the mic, who's next to you. Why, why did you just defect? Um, it's just a short game that um, makes sense to defect in the last period, so the second last period, the first period, so. Ah, all right, that's an interesting idea. So, so Patrick's saying, Patrick's saying, uh, actually, if we, if we look at the last period of this game, if we look at this last period of the game, what does the game look like in the last period? In the last period, this actually is the game, right? If I, if I drew out the game with two periods, it'd be kind of a hard thing to draw. It'd be kind of an, an annoying diagram to draw. But in the last period of the game, whatever happened in the first period is what? It's sunk, is that right? Everything happened in the first period is sunk. So in the last period of the game, these are the only relevant payoffs, is that right? And in this, since these are the only relevant payoffs looking forward, in the last period of the game, we know that there's actually a dominant strategy. And what is that dominant strategy in the last period of the game? To do what? In prison's dilemma, what's, what's, what's the dominant strategy? Shout it out. Defect. Defect, okay. So what we should see in this game, we didn't actually, we didn't actually because we had some kindness over here from Edwina, but, but okay, but what we should see in general is we know that in the last period of the game, in period two, we're going to get both people defecting. All right? And the reason we're going to get both people defecting is because the last period of the game is just a one-shot game. Right? There's nothing, nothing particularly exciting about it. There is no tomorrow, and so people are going to defect. But now, let's go back and revisit some of the arguments that uh, Edwina and Brooks and... Uh, I've forgotten what your, what's your neighbor called again? Ben. And Ben, no, I should remember that. And Ben said earlier, right? They, they, they gave quite elaborate reasons for cooperating. Co uh, cooperating to establish reputation, cooperating because the other person might cooperate, whatever, all right? But most of these, beha most of these behaviors were designed to, in to either induce or promise cooperation in period two, is that right? But what we've just argued is that in period two, everyone's gonna defect, right? Period two is just a trivial one-stage prisoner's dilemma. We actually analyzed it the very first week of the class and provided we believe these payoffs, we're done. Period two, people are gonna defect. Since they're going to defect in period two, nothing I can do in period one is going to affect that behavior, and therefore, I should defect also in period one. Right? If you want to belabor this point, we can actually draw up what the matrix looks like in period one, so let's do that, using the style we did last week, all right? Uh, uh, right before, two weeks ago, before, the, before we went away. All right, so here, once again, is uh, the matrix we had before, and I want to analyze the first stage game. In the first stage game, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in the payoffs I'm going to get from tomorrow. The payoffs I'm going to get from tomorrow are from tomorrow's equilibrium. 
But this isn't going to do very much for me, as we'll see, because I'll get 2 plus 0 tomorrow, because we know I'm playing defect tomorrow, 2 plus 0 tomorrow, minus 1 plus 0 tomorrow, 3 plus 0 tomorrow, 3 plus 0 tomorrow, minus 1 plus 0 tomorrow, and 0 plus 0 tomorrow, 0 plus 0 zero tomorrow. All right? So just as we did with the War of Attrition game two weeks ago, we can put in the payoffs from tomorrow. We can roll back those equilibrium payoffs to today. It's just in this particular exercise, it's rather a boring thing because I'm just adding zero to everything. All right? When I add zero to everything, uh, when I, get, I then just cancel out the zeros, I'm back where I'm started. And of course, I should defect. All right? All right. So what I'm going to see is, because I'm going to defect anyway tomorrow, today is just like a one-shot game as well, and I'm going to get defect again. Now here we played the game twice and got defect effect. What about if we played the game three times? It's the same thing, right? We played the game three times, but we did play the game three times between uh, Edwina and Ben. There we know we're going to defect in the third round. Therefore, we may as well defect in the second to last round. Therefore, we may as well defect in the first round. And if we play it five times, we know we're going to all defect in the fifth round. Therefore, we may as well all defect in the fourth round. Therefore, we may as well all defect in the third, and so on. If we play it 500 times, we wouldn't have time in the class, but if we played it 500 times, we know in that 500th period, it's a one-shot game and people are going to defect. And therefore, in the 499th period, people are going to defect. And therefore, in the 498th period, people are going to defect, and so on. All right? So the problem here is that we get unraveling, something we've seen before in this class, we get unraveling from the back. I have a worry that there might only be one L in unraveling in America. Is that right? How many L's do you put in unraveling in America? One? I've just come back from England, and my, and my spelling is somewhere in the Middle Atlantic right now. I'll leave it as one. All right, un unraveling from the back. Essentially, this is a backward induction argument. Oh, and instead of, instead of using backward induction, we're really using subgame perfection. We're looking at the equilibria in the last games, and as we roll back up the game, we get unraveling. So here's bad news. The bad news is we'd hoped that by having repeated interaction in the prisoner's dilemma, we would be able to sustain cooperation. That's been our hope since day one of the class. In fact, we stated it kind of confidently in the first day of the class. And we kind of intuitively believe it. But what we're discovering is, even if you played this game for 500 times and then stopped, you wouldn't be able to sustain cooperation in equilibrium because we're going to get unraveling in the last stage and so on and so forth. All right? So it seems like our big hope that repeat interaction would induce cooperation in society is going down the plug hole. That's bad. All right, so let's come back and modify our lesson a little bit. So what went wrong here was in the last period of the game, there was no incentives generated by the future, right? So there was no promise of future rewards or future punishments, and therefore cooperation broke down, and then we had unraveling. All right, so the lesson here is what? The lesson is, but... For this to work, it helps to have a future. It helps to have a future. Right? This whole idea of repeated interaction was the future was going to create incentives for the present. But if games come to an end, there's going to be some point when there isn't a future anymore. And then we get unraveling. All right. Now, this is not just a formal technical point to be made in the ivory tower of Yale. This is a true idea. So, for example, uh, if we think about uh, um, uh, CEOs or presidents or managers of sports teams, there's a term we use for there's a, there's, there's a word we use, at least in the states, for uh, to describe such such leaders when they're getting towards the end of their term and everyone knows it. What's the what's, what's the expression we use? Lame duck, all right? So we have this lame duck effect. The lame duck effect at the end of somebody's term undermines their ability to uh, cooperate, their ability to provide incentives for people to cooperate with them, uh, and uh, causes a problem. So this lame duck effect affects presidents, but it also affects CEOs of companies. All right? But it's not just leaders who run into this problem. All right? So if you have an employee in your, if you're employing somebody, 
and you, don't ha you, have a, you may have a contract with the person you're employing, but basically you're sustaining cooperation with this person because you interact with them often, you know you're always going to interact with them, but then this employee approaches retirement, everyone knows that in April or something they're going to retire, then the future can't provide incentives anymore and you have to switch over from the implicit incentive of knowing you're going to be interacting in the future to an explicit incentive of putting incentive clauses in the contract. All right, so retirement can cause, if you like, a lame duck effect. Retirement. All right, and this is even true in personal relationships. With your personal relationships with your friends, if you think that those friendships are going to go on for a long time, be they with your significant other or just with the people you hang out with, you're likely to get a lot of cooperation. But if, uh, as with perhaps most economic majors, most of your significant others are only going to last for a day at most, you're not going to get great cooperation, right? You're going to get cheating, all right? All right, no one's rising to that one, but I guess it's true, all right? So what do we call these? Economics majors relationships. All right, these are kind of end effects. All of these things are, are caused by the fact that the relationship is coming to an end. And once the relationship is coming to an end, that all those threats and promises of future behavior, implicit or otherwise, are, are gonna basically disappear. All right. So at this point, we might think, we might think the following. You might conclude the following. You might conclude that if a relationship has a known end, if everyone knows the relationship's going to end at a certain time, then we're done. And we, we basically can't sustain cooperation through repeated interaction. All right? And that's kind of what, this, what the example we looked at seems to suggest. However, that's not quite true. That's not quite true. So let's look at another example where a, relation, where a relationship is going to have a known end, but nevertheless we are able to sustain some cooperation, and we'll see how. Okay? So again, I've been careful here. I've said it helps to have a future. I haven't said it's necessary to have a future. All right, so that's, that's good news for the economics majors again. All right, so let's do... This example to illustrate that even a finite interaction, even an interaction that's going to end, and everyone knows it's going to end, might still have some hope for cooperation. So we look at this uh, slightly more complicated game here, and this game has three strategies, we'll call them A, B, and C, for each player. And the payoffs are as follows, 4-4, four, 0-5, four, zero, 0-0, zero, zero. down here we'll do 0-0, zero, 0-0, zero. Zero, zero. and 3-3, three, three. and the middle row, 5-0, one, one, zero, zero. All right? And we're going to assume that this game, just like we did with the first, with the first time we did Prisoner's Dilemma, uh, this game is going to be played twice. All right? It's going to be repeated. It's going to be played twice, repeated once. All right? So let's just make sure we understand what's, what, this, what the point of this game is. Uh, in this game, in the one-shot game, I hope it's clear that AA is kind of the cooperative thing to do, right? We'd like to sustain, we'd like to sustain play of AA. Because then both players get four, and that looks pretty good for everybody, all right? However, in the one-shot game, in the one-shot game, AA is not a Nash equilibrium. Why is AA not a Nash equilibrium? Let me grab those mics again. Why is AA not a Nash equilibrium? So I'll just work with one. Anybody? Yep. I'm even getting the names at this stage of the terms. This is Katie, right? So shout out. The best response to the other guy playing A is playing B. Good, good. So if, 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 if I think the other person's going to play A, I'm going to want to defect and play B and obtain an, a gain, a gain of one. So basically I'll get five rather than four. All right? I'll defect to playing B and get five rather than four for a gain of one. Is that right? All right. So AA is not a Nash equilibrium in the one-shot game. We're sometimes going to call that, well, that's fine, in the one-shot game. 
So now imagine we play this game twice. Instead of just playing once, we're going to play this game two times. All right? So now, oh, well, sorry, before, I'll come back to that. Before I do that, what are, the, what are the pure strategy Nash equilibria in this game? Anybody? So BB, so the Nash equilibria, the Nash equilibria in this one-shot game are BB and CC, all right? BB, there's, there's some mixed ones as well, but this will do. All right, so BB and CC are the, uh, the, the pure strategy Nash equilibria. All right, now consider playing this game twice. All right, now last time we looked at a game played twice, well, it was Prisoner's Dilemma, and we noticed that we couldn't sustain cooperation because in the last stage, people weren't going to cooperate, and have, hence in the first stage, people weren't going to cooperate. But let's look what happens here. If this game is played twice, is there any hope of sustaining cooperation, i.e. A, in both stages? Could we have people play A in the first stage and then play A again in the second stage? All right, so Patrick's shaking his head, so that's right, so shake his head, let me grab the other mic. All right, so, so why, why is that not going to work? Why, why can't we get people to cooperate and play A in both periods? Shout out. In the second period, you're still in effect and play B. Good, good. So in the second period, exactly the argument that Katie produced just now in the one-shot game applies because the second period game is a one-shot game. All right, so we we've got no hope of sustaining cooperation in both periods. Let's call this cooperation. All right, we can't sustain... We can't sustain AA in period two in the second period. However, I claim that we may be able to get people to cooperate in the first period of the game. All right? Now, how are we going to do that? So to see that, let's consider the following strategy. So, but consider the strategy. Right, the strategy is going to be play A and then play C if AA was played and play B otherwise. All right, so this strategy is an instruction telling pl the player how to play. Now, before we consider whether this is an equilibrium or not, I need to have some inverted commas here as well. Before we consider whether this is an equilibrium or not, let's just check that this actually is a strategy. All right, so what does a strategy have to do? It has to tell me what I should do, it should give me an instruction, at each of my information sets. In this two-period game, each of us, each of the players in the game, have two information sets. They have an information set at the beginning of the game, and they have another information set at the beginning of period two. Is that right? So it has to tell you what to do at the first information set and at the second information set, and it does. All right? It says play A at the first one. All right? And then the, the beginning of period two, well, now, now I said there's only one information set there, but actually there's nine possible information sets, depending what happened in the, in the first period. So each thing that happened in the first period is associated with a different information set. I always know what happened in the first period. And at each of those nine information sets, it tells me what to do at the beginning of period two. In particular, it says, if it turns out that AA was played, then play C now. And otherwise, for all the other eight possible information sets I could find myself in, play B. All right? So this is a strategy. Now, of course, the big question is, is this strategy an equilibrium? And in particular, is it a subgame perfect equilibrium? Is this a subgame perfect equilibrium? Let me be a bit more precise. If both players were playing this strategy, would that be a subgame perfect equilibrium? All right, well, let's have a look. And of course, I can't see it now, so let's pull both these boards down.
So to check, that the, to check whether this is a subgame perfect equilibrium, we're going to have to check what? We're going to have to check that it induces Nash behavior in each subgame. I think the battery is going on that. Shall I get rid of that? Sorry. OK, I'm going to shout. Can people still hear me? People in the balcony, can they hear me? Yep, OK. So we're going to have to see if we can sustain Nash behavior Yeah, thanks. We're going to see if we can sustain Nash behavior in every subgame. So let's start with the subgames associated with the second period. All right, now technically, there are nine such subgames, depending on what happened in the past, depending on what happened in the first period. There's a subgame following AA, there's a subgame following AB, there's a subgame following AC, and so on. Should we be okay? Put it on a second. All right. So for, for each activity in the first period, for each, for each profile in the first period, there's a subgame. However, it doesn't really matter to distinguish all of these subgames particularly carefully here, since uh, the, the, the cost from the past, uh, what happened in the past, is, is sunk. All right? So we'll just look at them as a whole. All right? So in period two, in period two, after... A, uh, after AA, all right, so in one particular, the, one particular of those nine subgames, after AA, this strategy induces, induces CC. All right, so if people play A in the, if both people play A in the first period, then in the subgame following, people are supposed to play CC. Is that a Nash equilibrium of the subgame? Well, was CC, was CC a Nash equilibrium? Yeah, it's one of our Nash equilibrium. Let's just look up there. We've got it listed. Here it is. So we're playing this Nash equilibrium. So that is a Nash equilibrium, so we're OK. All right? After the other choices in period one, This strategy induces BB. That's good news, too, because BB, we already agreed, was a Nash equilibrium in the, in the, uh, in, uh, in, in the one-shot game. All right? So in, both, you know, in all of those nine subgames, the one after AA and the eight after everything else, we're playing Nash behavior. So that's good. What about in the whole game? So in the whole game. In the whole game, starting from period one, right, we have to ask, do you do better to play the strategy as designated, in particular to, to, choose, uh, to choose A, or would you do better to defect? All right, well, let's have a look. So if I choose A, then my, uh, remember the other person, the other person is playing this, this strategy. So if I choose A, then my payoff in this period comes from AA and is 4. That's if, I choose, if I choose A, then we're both playing A in this period, and I get 4. Right? And tomorrow, according to this strategy, tomorrow, right, tomorrow, since we both played A, we'll now pl both of us will now play C. Since we're both playing C, I'll get an additional payoff of three. All right, so tomorrow, CC will occur, and I'll get three for a total of seven. All right? What about if I defect? Well, we could consider lots of possible defections, but let's just consider the obvious defection. You can check the other ones at home. So if I defect, if I defect and choose B now, then in this period, in this period, I will be playing B, and my opponent or my pair will be playing A. So in this period, I will get five. All right? And tomorrow, 
tomorrow, since AA did not occur, both of us will play B. Both of us will play B and get a continuation payoff of 1. So the continuation payoff this time will be following from BB, and I'll get 1. Why don't I do what I've been doing before in this class and put boxes around the continuation payoff just to indicate that they are, in fact, continuation payoffs. All right? So if I play A, I get 4 now and a continuation payoff of 3 for a total of 7. If I play B now, yeah, I gain something now. I get 5 now. But tomorrow, I'll only get 1 for a total of 6. All right? So in fact, 7 is bigger than 6. So I'm OK, and I won't want to do this defection. All right. Now, I just really want to write this one other way, because it's going to be useful for later. All right, so one other way to write this, I mean, I think we've convinced ourselves that this is, this is an equilibrium, but one other way to write this is, uh, and it's a more general way of it in repeated games, is to write it explicitly comparing the temptations to cheat today with the rewards and punishments from tomorrow. All right, so what we want to do is, in general, we can just rewrite this as checking that the temptation, the temptation to, to cheat or defect today is smaller than the value of the reward minus the value of the punishment. But the key words here are defecting occurs today, rewards and punishments occur tomorrow. All right? If we just rewrite it this way, we'll see exactly the same thing, it's just rearranging slightly. The temptation to defect today is I get five rather than four, or if you like, a gain of one. And the value of the reward tomorrow was, uh, the value of the reward, the reward was to play CC tomorrow and get three. The value of the punishment tomorrow was to play BB tomorrow and get one. Right, and that difference is two. All right, so here, the fact that the temptation is outweighed by the difference between the value of the reward and the value of the punishment is what enabled us to sustain cooperation. Right, I'm just writing that more general way because this, this is a way that we can apply in games from here on. Right, we're going to compare temptations to cheat with tomorrow's promises. Patrick, yeah, let me, let me get you a mic. understand why it's reasonable to think you would play BB in the second period, though, Good. instead of, you have a, in the second period, you have a temptation to play CC, even if the person defected on you. Good, good. So that's, that's, that's a very good point. So what Patrick's saying is, how come, it's, saying, it's all very well to say we're sustaining cooperation in the first period here, but the way in which we sustained cooperation was by going along with, as it were, the punishment tomorrow. Right? It required me tomorrow to go along with the strategy of choosing B if I cheated in the first period. Right? And I want to answer this twice, once disagreeing with him and once agreeing with him. Okay? So let me just disagree with him first. So notice tomorrow, if the other person, the other player, is going to play B, then I'm going to want to play B. All right? So the key, the key idea here, here is, as always in Nash equilibrium, if I take the other person's player as given and just look at my own behavior, if I think the other person is playing the strategy, and hence he's going to play B tomorrow after I've cheated, then I want to play B myself. So that check is just our standard check, and actually that's the check that makes sure that it really is a subgame perfect equilibrium. We're not, we're not putting some punishments down the tree that are arising out of equilibrium. They have to be, it has to be that I want to do tomorrow what I'm told to do tomorrow. All right? So that idea seems right, uh, and I'm kind of glad Patrick raised it because it was the next thing in my notes. Right? I want to go along with this punishment because if the other person's playing B, I want to play B myself. All right, so that's that. Um, but nevertheless, I think Patrick's onto something, and let me come back to it in a minute. So let me come back to it in a minute. All right, 
But I, it, what I want to do before I do that is just draw out a general lesson from this game. And the general lesson is we can sustain cooperation even in a finitely repeated game, but to do so, we need there to be more than one Nash equilibrium in the stage game. What we need there to be is several Nash equilibria, one at least of which we can use as a reward, and another one which we can use as a punishment. Right? So even if a game is only played a finite number of times, if there are several equilibria in the subgame, several equilibria, equilibria in the stage game, let me just bring this down and show again, several equilibria in the, in the stage game, both BB and CC, we can use one of them as a reward and the other one as a punishment and use that difference to try and get people to resist temptations today. All right? So that's the general idea here. And let's just write that down. But Patrick, don't, don't, don't let me get away with not coming back to your point. I want to come back to it in a second. All right? So the lesson here is If a stage game, a stage game is the game that's going to be repeated. If a stage game has more than one Nash equilibrium in it, then we may be able to use the prospect of playing different equilibria different equilibria tomorrow to provide incentives And we can think of these incentives as rewards and punishments. As rewards and punishments for cooperation today. All right, in the game we just saw, there were exactly two pure strategy Nash equilibria in the subgame. We used one of them as a reward and the other one as a punishment, and we were able to sustain cooperation in a subgame perfect equi equilibrium. All right, now a question arises here, and I think it's behind Patrick's question. And that is, how plausible is this? How plausible is this? We really, it's okay, formally, if we write down the, the game and do the math, this comes out. But how plausible is this as a, as a model of what's going on in society? Right? And I think the worry, I'm guessing this is the worry that was behind Patrick's question, is, is this. Suppose I'm playing this game with Patrick, and suppose Patrick cheats on me the first period. So Patrick chooses B when I wanted him to choose A in the first period. Right? And now in, in, in the second period, according to the equilibrium instructions, we're supposed to play BB and get payoffs of one rather than CC and get payoffs of three. Let's just make that, make that visible again. All right. But suppose Patrick comes to me in the meantime. So between period one and period two, Patrick shows up at my office hours and he says, yeah, I know I cheated on you yesterday. All right. But why should we punish ourselves today? Why should we both of us lose today by playing the BB equilibrium? Why don't we both switch to the CC equilibrium? After all, that's better for both of us. You know, it's true that Patrick's saying to me, it's true that I cheated you yesterday, but why you know, let bygones be bygones, or why cry over spilt milk? Or he'll use some other sort of uh, saying uh, plucked out of the Book of Platitudes and, and, and say to me, well, why, why go along with the punishment? Let's just, let's just play the good equilibrium now. Right? And if I look at things, I say, well, actually, you know, it's true I got nothing in the first period because Patrick kind of cheated me in the first period. So it's true I got nothing yesterday. And it's true it was Patrick who caused me to get nothing yesterday. But nevertheless, that's a sunk cost. 
and I'm comparing getting one now with getting three now, why don't I just go along and get three? And in fact, if I, uh, uh, moreover, this isn't a, uh, I'm, I'm not in danger of being cheated again, because if Patrick believes I'm going to play C, he's going to play C2. All right? So that kind of argument, that kind of argument involves, what, it involves some kind of communication between stages, but it sounds like that's going to be a problem. Why? Well, suppose it's the case that we are going to get communication between periods, and suppose it's the case that someone with the gift of the gap, someone on his way to law school like Patrick, is going to be able to persuade me to go back to the good equilibrium for everybody in period two. Then we know we're going to play the good equilibrium in period two, and now we've lost any incentive to cooperate in period one. Right? The only reason I was willing to cooperate in period one was because the temptation to defect was outweighed by the difference between the value of the reward and the value of the punishment. If we're going to get the reward anyway, I'll go ahead and defect today. All right? So the problem here is this notion of renegotiation, this notion of communicating between periods, can undermine this kind of equilibrium. There's a problem that arises if we have renegotiation. All right? So there may be a problem of renegotiation. All right. Now this problem may not be a, such a big problem. For example, it may be I'll say, I'll be so angry at Patrick because he screwed me over in period one that I won't go along with the renegotiation. And it may also be the case, and we'll see some examples of this on the homework assignments, that the many equilibria in the second, uh, in the second stage of the game are not such that, we're that, that, uh, that a, punishment for, a punishment for Patrick is also a punishment for me. What really caused the problem here was in trying to punish Patrick, I had to punish myself. Right? But you could imagine games, and we'll see some concrete examples in the next, on the next homework assignment, in which punishing Patrick is rather fun for me, and punishing me is rather fun for Patrick. And that's going to be much harder to renegotiate our way out of. Right? There was a question. Let me get a mic out to the question. Uh, maybe, uh, Ali's about, yeah. Go ahead. But, uh, yeah, just uh, point into the microphone and shout. Yep. Uh, if we're ruling out renegotiation, can't we divide a devise a strategy for prisoner's dilemma as well, uh, ah. even though it doesn't have uh, multiple Nash equilibriums? Yeah, so the, the, the issue in, okay, good. So the issue there is in prisoner's dilemma, we, we uh, 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 established in the first week that if we're not allowed to make side payments, we're not allowed to bring in outside contracts, then no amount of communication is going to help us. Right? So you're right, if we can rely on uh, the courts or the mafia to enforce the contract, that would be fine, and then, then communication would have bites. But if you remember way back in the first week when we tried to talk our way out of, ba of bad behavior in the prisoner's dilemma, it didn't help precisely because it's a dominant strategy. Right? Whereas here, here, Patrick's conversation, Patrick's verbal agreement to play the other equilibrium is, is an agreement to play a Nash equilibrium. That's what's, that's, that's what's getting us into trouble. All right. All right. So what may help us here, what may avoid renegotiation, is simply I'm not going to go along with that renegotiation. I just am too angry about having been cheated on. And it may be, for other reasons, it may actually be that I enjoy the punishment. Nevertheless, this is a real problem in society. I think we should pretend that this problem isn't there. So a good example is in bankruptcy. which is one of those words I can never spell. It seems to have too many consonants in it. Is that right? It's approximately right, anyway. All right? So bankruptcy law uh, in the US for the last 200-odd years has gone through cycles. And it, during, during, one way to view these cycles is they're cycles of relaxing the law and re making life, quote, easier for borrowers, and then tightening up again. All right? This is not a recent phenomenon. I mean, this is not only a recent phenomenon. This occurred throughout the 19th century. Right, so what typically happened was there was re uh, either explicit renegotiation between parties or re renegotiation through act of Congress or sometimes through the act of, 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 uh, of the states in which uh, bankrupt uh, debtors were uh, basically let off or given easier terms. And the argument was always the same. These people are not going to pay back now. Right? It's clear uh, from the 19th century, uh, often uh, if you were bankrupt, you were in jail. 
All right, actually worse than that. Sometimes in, in, in the 19th century in England, not only if you were bankrupt were you in jail, but your creditors were having to pay the fees to feed you in jail. Right? So there you were sitting in jail, you weren't paying that money back to your creditor, and you were actually costing money to your creditor by being in jail. This seems like a situation that you want to, rene you want to renegotiate your way out of. You say, hey, let's let these guys out of jail, let them be productive again, and they'll pay back part of the loans. Right? So you had these waves of bankruptcy reform in which, uh, a bank, uh, in which the, uh, the, the uh, debtors' jails, were, were, debtors' prisons were closed down, people were let out, people were relieved of debt. What's the problem with doing that? I mean, that? That seems like a good idea, right? After all, you don't want all these people bankrupt, uh, in debt, not paying money back to their creditors anyway. That doesn't seem like a good situation in society. That seems like a good, a, 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 a renegotiation that's a win-win situation. It's better for everybody. What's the problem with it, though? Yeah, what's the, let's get a, a mic down here. What's the problem with this? Here, here we go. Yeah. It incentivizes bankruptcy. Right, it creates an incentive for people not to repay in the first place. It, make, it creates an incentive for people to take big risks now, all right? And, and, and hence, it makes bankruptcy, if you like, or makes, makes uh, re uh, non-repayment of debt more likely. So this has been going on for a while, but you see it very much today if you read the financial pages of the papers in the, in, in, in the last few weeks. There's a big worry in the U.S. right now about people failing to repay. What kind of debt? What kind of debt's the big worry about? Mortgage debt, right? So both people who are house owners failing to pay back mortgage debt and uh, equally worrying financial institutions that have, that have lent a lot of, for example, subprime debt, now finding themselves in financial trouble. And you're going to read a lot in the papers about not uh, letting people out lightly out of, those, uh, out of those situations of being in debt or not letting people out, out lightly out of bankruptcy. Right? What, what's the, 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 the term you're going to hear is bailout. So bailout, right, you, the, the argument's going to be, the argument you're going to read is you don't want the government or the central bank bailing out those financial institutions who have apparently taken too large risks on subprime mortgage debt, even though we all agree it's better right now for those financial institutions not to go under. And why are we not going to, even though it's better for everybody for not to go under, why are we not going to bail them out? Because it undermines the incentives for them not to make bad loans to start with. And to a lesser extent, you're going to hear that on the debtor side as well. You're going to hear some people say we shouldn't be bailing out people who took who took on bad loans to borrow, to, to, uh, who took on bad mortgages to uh, to finance their houses again for bailout reasons. All right. So this is an important trade-off. If you go on to law school, you're going to see a lot about this this kind of discussion. And this is the discussion of trading off ex ante efficiency and ex post efficiency. Sometimes, as Patrick's pointed out in the game just now, the ex post efficient thing to do is to go back to the good equilibrium, or if you like, to bail out these firms who've made bad loans. However, from an ex ante point of view, it creates bad incentives for people to make those loans in the first place. In the ex ante point of view, it created the incentive for people to defect in the first period of that game. All right, so this theme of ex ante versus ex post efficiency is not one we're going to go into anymore in this class, but it should be there in the back of your minds when you all end up in law school in a few years' time. Okay, so, so far, what have we done? We've been looking at repeated interaction and seeing if it can sustain cooperation. And the first thing we learned was that if the repeated interaction is a finite interaction, if we know when it's going to end, if we know when the interaction is going to end, then sustaining cooperation is going to be hard because in the last period, there'll be an incentive to defect. We saw we could get around that to some extent if games have multiple equilibria, but in a game like Prisoner's Dilemma, we're really in trouble. Things will unravel from the back. All right? So now let's mix things up a little bit by looking at a more complicated variety of repeated interactions. Rather than just play the game once or twice or three times, let's play the game under the following rules. We'll, we'll go back to our same players. Uh, how many mics are still out here? They, they, I, I took them both back. Is that right? So I'm, I'm taking both the green and the blue mic. I'm giving them back to our players. All right? So this is to to Brooks, and this is to Patrick, all right? And we're going to have Brooks and Patrick play Prisoner's Dilemma again. I'm hoping I haven't deleted it, but maybe I did. All right, well, it doesn't matter. We, 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 we know the payoffs. We're going to have them play Prisoner's Dilemma again, but this time 
in between every play of the game, I'm going to toss a coin. Actually, I'll toss the coin twice. And if that coin comes up heads both times, then the game will end. But otherwise, they'll play again. All right, so everyone's how we're going to do. We're going to play Prisoner's Dilemma. At the end of every period, I'll toss a coin twice. I might get Jake to toss it. I'll go toss a coin twice. If it comes up heads both times, the game's over. But otherwise, the game continues. All right? So both Brooks and Patrick should get ready to play. And the payoffs of this game is just what we had before. So let's just remind ourselves what the payoffs of that game are. So we've got cooperate, defect, cooperate, defect. 2-2, two, two, minus 1, 3. 3 minus 1. And 0-0. Zero, zero. And we'll keep score here. So this is uh, Brooks and Patrick. All right, so putting pressure on these guys, let's, uh, let's write down what you're going to do the first time. All right, Brooks. Defect. Defect, better? Cooperate. All right, we, we're, I think we're getting some payback from earlier, right? <laughs> All right, round two. Are, are you going to toss a coin? Oh, I have to toss a coin, you're absolutely right, thank you. Uh, and I have to find a coin without... Ah, look at that, thank you, Ellie. Uh, uh, twice. Toss it twice. Heads. 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 Heads again. So the game is over. That didn't last long. <laughs> let's just for the, just for the sake of uh, the class, let's pretend that it came up tails. Okay. Okay. We'll cheat a little bit. We'll cheat a little bit. Okay. So we're playing a second time, uh, just with a little bit of cheating. I need someone else. Someone. Someone less honest to toss the coin. Brooks, what do, you, what, what, do you, what do you choose? Oh, I'm defecting. I'm defecting again, all right. Patrick? Cooperate. <laughs> Cooperate. Uh, Patrick seems very trusting here, all right. Let's toss the coin a third time. I already did it. Ah, it's okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, uh, uh, Brooks? I'm going to defect again. Defect. All right. Okay, so this time we'll, we'll end it. Okay, so, so what happened this time is let's talk about it a bit. So the Brooks and Patrick were playing, all right? Patrick so cooperated a bit at the beginning. Brooks defected throughout. Brooks, why did you defect? Shout out so everyone can hear you. All right, why did you defect right from the start of the game? Uh, because, because last time it didn't work so well. <laughs> last time it didn't work so well. Okay, okay, it's fair enough. Fair enough. But, e okay, but even after Patrick was corpora started cooperating, you went on defecting. So uh, yeah. uh, why, why then? Um, because Shout I, out? Uh, because I wanted to get the higher payoff from. I, I thought either he would continue cooperating and I could defect. Um, and. All right, all right. So, so you I thought <laughs> he'd go on cooperating, which in fact he did. In fact, he did. Uh, Patrick, why were you cooperating early on here? Shout, shout out so people, oh. people can hear you. So, with a two head rule, like you have a 75% chance of having another game. So, with those payoffs, um, even one period, the payoff of cooperating twice is the same as defecting once. So, like additional periods, it, it's better if you can continue cooperating, uh, and the percentage is high enough that. All it right, makes so you sense figure there's a good so. enough chance of, of, of getting to go. Now, even after Brooks defected the first period, you went on cooperating, but then after hit, after the second period, you gave up and started defecting. Yeah. Had it gone in a fourth period, what would you have done? Defected. You defected again, yeah. all right, and 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 fifth period. Well, if she kept defecting, I would keep defecting. All right, so, so what Patrick's saying is he started off cooperating, but once he saw that Brooks was defecting, he was going to switch to defect, and basically as long as she went on defecting, he was going to switch stick with defecting. All right, let's try a different pair. So uh, why don't we switch it over to your partners there? So, so uh, to Ben here and, um, I'm sorry, Edwina. Edwina, all right. We'll flip, flip, we'll flip, we'll flip twice. All right, all right. So people who want to see, why don't you just stand up? I want to see these people. So stand up a second. So these are our players. I want people at the back to make sure we know we know who are, who are playing. This is Edwina and this is Ben. All right, all right, good. All right, okay. So uh, Edwina, uh, you, you sit down again so you can actually write things down. Okay. So all right. So Edwina and Ben. Edwina, uh, uh, choose, uh, have you both written down the strategy? 
Ben, have you written down the strategy? Yep. Edwina, what did you choose? Cooperate. So Edwina's cooperating. Ben? Cooperate. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Let's toss a coin. So we're okay, we're okay, so we're still playing, okay. Edwina? Cooperate. Ben? I chose cooperate. All right, so they're cooperating. Tails again, so you're still playing. Cooperate. Cooperate. All right, so they're still cooperating. Some pain in the voice this time. <laughs> Heads and then tails. So write down what you're going to do. Edwina? Defect. Ben? Cooperate. All right, all right. So things were going so nicely there. <laughs> we had such a nice class going on there and everything. All right. So all right, so we're still playing. Edwina? Defect. Ben? Defect. All right, all right. Jay? Tails and tails are still going? Defect. Defect. All right, let me, let, let me, let me stop it there. We'll pretend, we'll, pretend it, we'll pretend that we had two heads. So let's, let's talk about this, right? So we had some cooperation going on here. Both people started cooperating. So, uh, Ben, what, why did you cooperate at the beginning? Shout out so people can hear. Why did you cooperate? Well, going along with Patrick's reasoning, I felt that if we could have the cooperate cooperate in the long term with a 75% chance of continuing playing, that it would be a worthwhile investment. All right, all right. Until I realized that Ed Edwina started defecting. Well, let's, let's come back to that in a second. <laughs> let's, 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 let's get you guys to stand up again so people, people can hear you. I think, I think people, when you stand up, you shout more. So stand, stand up again. Yeah, so Edwina, why, why, why did you, so you also started cooperating. Why did you start cooperating? Um, for the same reason. Same reason, okay, okay. So the, so the key thing here is why, why did you start defecting? This is, you heard the big sigh in the class. Why, why did you start defecting at this stage? Um, because we'd had so many, I mean, the, the coin top, Cutoff toss it had to come to head to head sometime, so I started thinking that this is reversion to the mean of the coins. Yeah, is that I right? just thought Sorry. that. It <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe. I mean, I thought. I don't know. Kind of <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. So what did I say about the relationship of, of economic majors that are on the class? Anyway, <laughs> all right. So uh, so uh, so Edwina defected, and then Ben, you switched after that. Why did you switch? Um, because once Edwina started defecting. I felt that we'd revert back to the defect effect equilibrium. All right, all right. So, so th thank you, thank you, guys. Okay. So, let's have a look at this strategy here. People started off cooperating, and I claim that at least Ben Ben can contradict me a second. But I, I think Ben's strategy here was something like this: I'm going to cooperate, and I'm going to go on cooperating as long as we're cooperating. But if at some point, if at some point Edwina defects, or for that matter, someone I defects. Then you know the game. Uh, this relationship's over, and we're going to play defect forever. Is that right? That's, that's kind of a, a rough description of your strategy. All right, all right. And Edwina was more or less playing the same thing. In fact, it was her who defected. But once she defected, she realized that you know, it was over, and he went on defecting. All right. So this strategy has a name. Let's just be clear what the uh, strategy is. This strategy says play C, which is cooperate, and then. Then play C if no one has played D. And play D otherwise. All right, so start off by cooperating. Keep cooperating as long as nobody's cheated. But if somebody cheats, this relationship's over. We're just going to defect forever. All right? Now, this strategy is a famous strategy. It has a name. Anyone know what the name is? This is called the Grim Trigger Strategy. The Grim Trigger Strategy. The Grim Trigger Strategy. So this strategy, again, it says we're going to cooperate. We're going to cooperate, but if that cooperation breaks down ever, even if it's me who breaks it down, then I'm just going to defect forever. All right. All right. 
Now, we're going to come back next time so you can see if this is an equilibrium, but, before, but, but there's a few things to do first. First, let's just check that it actually is a strategy. Right? What does it mean to be a strategy again? It has to tell us what to do at every information set I could define myself at. And this game is potentially infinite. Right? So it potentially, there's an infinite number of, inform of information sets I could reach. So you might think that writing down a strategy that gives me an instruction at every single information set is going to be incredibly complicated once we go to games that are potentially infinite. Because right? there needs to be an infinite number of instructions. But it turns out, actually, there, it's possible to write down such strategies rather simply, at least if they're, if they're simple strategies. And this example is one. This tells me what to do at the first information set. It says play C. It then tells me for every information set I find myself at in which only cooperation has ever occurred in the history of the game, I'm going to go on cooperating, play C. And it says for all other histories, for all other information sets I might find myself at, play D. Right? So it really is a strategy. All right. Now, this is very different behavior. Both we, we, we played with the same players. This kind of behavior is very different, uh, in both games actually, is very different than the, than, the, than the behavior we saw in the game that ended, the game with two periods or three periods. What is it essentially that made this different? What's different about this way of playing Prisoner's Dilemma, where we, tossed, where we had Jake toss the coin, versus the way we played before, when we just played for five periods and then stopped? What's different about it? Somebody? Let's talk to our players. Okay, so is, is the mic still there? Patrick, do you, do you have your mic still? Patrick, why, why is this different? Uh, we, we don't know when the game is going to end or if it's going to end, so there's no Good. last period. Good. Good. So our analysis of the, f of the game before, the analysis of the prisoner's dilemma when we knew it was going to end after two periods or five periods, whatever it was, was we all knew it was going to end. Right? There was a clearly defined last period. When people are going to retire, we know the month in which they're going to retire. When presidents are going to step down, we know they're going to step down that period. When CEOs are going to go, we know they're going to, uh, well, we don't always know they're going to go, but let's pretend we do, right? All right? So what's different about this game is every time we play the game, there is a probability, in this case a, a three-quarters probability, that the game is going to continue to the next period. Right? Every time we play the game, with probability 0.75, there's going to be a future. All right? There's no obvious last period from which we can unravel the game in the way we did before. Right? Just to remind ourselves, the way in which cooperation, our analysis of cooperation, broke down in the finite repeated prisoner's dilemma was that when we looked at the last period, we know people are going to defect. And once that thread is loose, we can unravel it all the way back to the beginning. But here, since there is no last period, that unraveling argument never gets hold. All right? Now, instead, we're able to see strategies develop, like the Grim Trigger strategy, and notice that the Grim Trigger strategy has a pretty good chance of, of, of actually sustaining cooperation. So in particular, as long as people play this strategy, they are cooperating. All right? As long as people play this strategy, they are cooperating. It turns out that Edwina eventually gave up that strategy, but had she got on playing it, they'd have gone on cooperating forever. All right. But of course, there's a question here, and the question is, is this, in fact, an equilibrium? Right? We know that if people play this way, we get cooperation, but the question, the, sort of the, the, the thousand dollar question or whatever, is, is this an equilibrium? So what do we have to do to check whether this is an equilibrium or not? We have to mimic the argument we had before. We have to compare the temptation to defect today and compare that with the value of the reward to cooperating and the value of the punishment from defecting tomorrow. All right, so this basic idea is going to reemerge. Having said that, let me now delete it so I have some room. We're going to have to, to show this is an equilibrium. We need to show that the temptation to defect, the temptation to cheat in the short term is outweighed by the, the difference between the value of the reward and the value of the punishment. All right. So let's, let's set that up. 
Let's put the temptation here first. So the temptation in Prisoner's Dilemma, to, the temptation to cheat today is what? I'll get three rather than two. Is that right? So if I defect, when Edwina defected, here's Edwina defecting in this period, she got a payoff of three rather than the payoff of two she would have got from cooperating. All right? So the temptation here is just three minus two. And let's be clear, this is a temptation today. And we want to compare this with the value of the reward minus the value of the punishment. But the key point observation is that these occur tomorrow. These occur tomorrow. All right? So since they occur tomorrow, we have to weight them a little bit lower. All right? So in general, in general, the way in which we're going to weight them tomorrow is we're going to discount them, just like we did in our bargaining game. We're going to weight tomorrow's payments by delta. Where delta is less than 1. All right? Now, why, why is delta less than 1? Why, why are we weighing tomorrow less than payments today? Why, why are payments tomorrow worth less than payments today? Because tomorrow might not happen. Right? There are other reasons why, by the way. It might be that we're impatient to get the money today, and we just wanted to pay off in a hurry. Or it might be that she wanted to take the payment today and put it in the bank and earn interest. Right? There are other reasons why money today might be more valuable than money tomorrow. But in games, the most important reason is tomorrow may not happen. Right? Tomorrow, by tomorrow, you might be dead, or if not dead, at least Jake's thrown, thrown two heads in the coins. All right? So delta is less than 1. Because the game may end. Because the game may end. Now, what's the value of the reward? The value of the reward is going to be the value of C forever. But I want to be careful about forever. It's C forever, but of course, it isn't really forever because the game may end. Right? So by, by forever, I mean until the game ends. Let me be a bit more careful, actually. It's CC, isn't it? The value of CC, cooperate, cooperate, forever. And here, we're going to have the value of DD forever. And once again, since it's the forever here means until the game ends. All right? So this is the calculation we're going to have to do. We're going to have to compare. The temptation, that was easy, that was just one, with the discounted value difference between the value of cooperation and the value of defecting. All right? Let's do the easy bits now, and then we'll leave you in suspense until Wednesday. Let's do all the easy bits. All right? So watch this delta in this case, in this particular game. What was the probability that the game was going to continue? What was the probability that the game was going to continue? What was the, what was the probability that the game was going to end? The probability of ending was 0.25, so delta here was 0.75. That's easy. All right? The second bit that's relatively easy is what's the value of playing DD until the game ends? Right? If, 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 once people have cheated, you're going to play D forever. Here we are. Edwin is cheating here. You're going to get DD in this period, DD in this period, and so on and so, so forth until the game ends. In each of those periods, you're going to earn zero. So this is just zero. Which leaves us with the messy bit. What's the value of cooperating forever? Let's try and do it. We've got one, we've got one minute. Let's do it. So in every period in which we both cooperate, what do we earn? So in the next period, we're going to next here at the beginning of the game, right? We cooperated in the first period. Now in the second period, we cooperate again. What payoff do we get from cooperating again? We get two, right? We get two. And then Jake tosses his coin, 
And with probability delta, we continue. All right? And we're going to cooperate again. So with probability delta, we cooperate again and get what payoff the next pair is. Two again. And then Jake tosses the coin again. All right? So now he's tossed the coin twice. So with probability delta squared, we're still playing, and we get two. And then Jake tosses the, the, the coin again, so if, if it comes up uh, other than head-head again, that's the, with probability delta cubed, we get two, and so on. All right? So your exercise between now and Wednesday is figure out what the value of cooperation forever is, figure out this equation, and find what value, find whether in fact it was an equilibrium for people to cooperate. And we'll pick it up on Wednesday.